Halima's house is unexpectedly blessed. Halima and her husband found their lives changed the moment they took Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him home. They had traveled to Makkah on a frail she ass that could barely keep up with their caravan. On the return journey, however, as Halima rode with the infant in her arms, the same animal moved so swiftly that it left the caravan behind. While Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him stayed with Halima's family, the house overflowed with blessings. Halima herself narrated that she brought Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him to her home during a drought. Her she camel would not give a drop of milk. Halima's child would cry the whole night out of hunger. With the child so distraught, Halima and Harith found it hard to sleep at night. Things changed, however, when Halima brought Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him home and placed him on her lap. Her breasts overflowed with milk so that both Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him and her own child drank their fill of milk and fell fast asleep. When Harith went to the she-camel, he was amazed at what he saw. The she-camel's udders were full of milk and ready to overflow. It gave so much milk that Halima's family was able to sleep that night on full stomachs. Halima's household suddenly appeared to be untouched by the drought, although they lived in Deir Banu Saad, the most drought-stricken spot in the region. The family's goats would return from grazing with their stomachs full of grass and their udders bursting with milk. Husband and wife would milk the goats often while others failed to get even a drop of milk. Halima's household continued to be blessed for the next two years, after which she weaned Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him. Although he grew up during a great drought, he had developed into a strong, healthy child. Halima asks to keep Muhammad longer. Every six months Halima would take Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him to Mecca to be with his mother and other family members. She would then return with him to Deir Banu Saad. After Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him was weaned, it was time for him to go back to his family for good. When Halima took him back to his mother, she begged Amina to let her keep the boy longer because he had brought her good fortune. She pleaded he would grow stronger and healthier in the desert, far away from the frequent epidemics that raged in Mecca. Amina consented, and Halima returned home with Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him happy at her extended good fortune. Two years later, however, a strange event occurred that frightened Halima and her husband, prompting them to return Muhammad to his family in Mecca. Muhammad's chest is opened, Anas bin Malik relates that one day as Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him was playing with some children near Halima's house, Jibril, the angel Gabriel, appeared and made Muhammad lie down. He then opened up the boy's chest, took out his heart, and extracted a lump of flesh from it, saying, This is the portion of Satan in you. Then he put Muhammad's heart in a golden tray filled with Zamzam water, washed it and replaced it in his chest. The other children ran to Halima in terror crying that Muhammad had been killed. When they reached Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him, they found him alive, his face pale from shock. Anis later said that he saw the scar on the Prophet's chest where it had been sewn back together. Muhammad's time with his mother. In the wake of this supernatural event, Muhammad was carried back to Mecca, where for the next two years he grew up under his mother's care. When Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was six, he accompanied his grandfather, mother, and Umayman on a journey to Yathrib, where his mother's family lived. It was also where his father lay buried. After a month in Yathrib, they began the long journey back to Mecca, but Amina fell ill on the way. She died at Abwa and was buried there. Muhammad was left orphaned. Her grandfather's affection, Abdul Muttalib, himself growing old, carried Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him back to Mecca. His heart was heavy, and he could not bear to see his young grandson suffer. He suddenly felt tenderness in his heart that he had never even felt for his own sons. When Abdul Muttalib sat with his friends, Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him sat on a carpet next to him, a position no one else was allowed to occupy. He used to stroke his back and observe his every movement. Abdul Muttalib was sure the future would bring Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him rare greatness. Tragically, Abdul Muttalib's time with his grandson was short, for he died when Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him was only eight years, two months and ten days old. Under his uncle's care, after the death of Abdul Muttalib, his son Abu Talib took Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him under his care. Abu Talib and Abdullah, the Prophet's father, were brothers, both born of the same mother. 
Abu Talib was not a wealthy man, but Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him brought Allah's blessings with him, and suddenly Abu Talib found that he could support his family easily with a small sum of money. Bahira's warning, when Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him was 12 years old, some sources specify that he was 12 years, 2 months and 10 days old, Abu Talib planned to accompany a trade caravan to Syria. Both Muhammad and Abu Talib dreaded the long separation, so Abu Talib decided to take Muhammad with him. Once the caravan reached Basra on the border of Syria, the travelers broke journey for a short stay. A Christian monk by the name of Bahira lived in this city, and he came to welcome the caravan. He walked past all the travelers approached the young Muhammad. Holding Muhammad's hand, he said, This is the chief of the world and the messenger of the Lord. God has sent him as a mercy for all mankind. Why do you say this? The people inquired of him. Bahira explained, when he came this side of the pass, stones and trees bowed in prostration. They do not prostrate for anyone other than a prophet. Moreover, I recognized him from the seal of prophethood, which lies like an apple on the soft bone below his shoulders. It is mentioned in our scriptures. Bahira then held a feast in honor of the caravan. Later he took Abu Talib aside and pleaded with him not to take Muhammad any further. He urged him to send the boy back. He feared that the Jews and Romans might recognize him as the promised messenger, in which case, he felt, Muhammad's life would be endangered. Abu Talib heeded the monk's warnings, and concerned for his nephew's safety, sent Muhammad back to Mecca. Coming of age in Mecca, Muhammad played an active role in his society, and participated in some significant events in the community, two of which are recounted below. 1. The Battle of Fijr when Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was twenty years old, a battle broke out at the fair of Okaz in the month of Dhul Qadar. The warring tribes were the Quraysh and Kanana on one side and the Qays Gilan on the other. The fighting was fierce, and several people on both sides were killed. At last they made peace on condition that whichever side had suffered the most casualties would get blood money, recompense for unlawful killing. This battle was the fourth and most deadly in a series of skirmishes, that had erupted each of the previous three years. It would, however, be the last. It came to be known as the Battle of Fijr, Arabic for immorality, as it took place in a sacred month, when fighting was prohibited and violated the sanctity sacred month with bloodshed. As a member of the Quraysh, Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him, was also present in the battle. His role was to collect the enemy's arrows and hand them over to his uncles. 2. Hilf al fadl in the wake of the Battle of Fijr, later that month a covenant was agreed upon among the five tribes of the Quraysh. It was known as Hilf al-Fadul and its signatories were Banu Hashim, Banu Abdul Muttalib, Banu Asad, Banu Zara and Banu Taim. This covenant was born in response to a shameful denial of justice to a stranger. A man came from Zabid to sell his merchandise in Mecca. A local resident by the name of Ars bin Wal took all of the stranger's goods, but refused to pay for them. The helpless stranger approached the people of Banu Abdul Dar, Banu Maxum, Banu Jamar, Banu Sam and Banu Adi, all of whom ignored his cry for redress. In desperation, he climbed atop a hill called Jabal Abu Qais and informed everyone of how all his goods had been stolen. Then he implored his listeners to come forward to help him. His plea was answered by Zubay bin Abdul Muttalib, who volunteered to help the unfortunate stranger. Zubayr called on representatives of all the clans to assemble in the house of Abdullah bin Jadan of Banu Taim. At this assembly, the tribal leaders agreed that henceforth they would stand up for anyone who had suffered injustice, regardless of his tribal affiliation. They then forced Aras bin Wal to return the merchandise he had taken. Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him, was also present with his uncles during the institution of the covenant, which he regarded as an honorable pact. Long after Allah had made him a prophet, he was to declare. I was present when a covenant was agreed upon in the house of Abdullah bin Jadan, and I would not accept even a red camel in lieu of it. Had I been asked to uphold it even in the days of Islam, I would have agreed. Choosing a profession, having lost his parents and his grandfather, Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him, who was in the care of his uncle Abu Talib, came of age with practically no inheritance. At first, he tried to make a living tending goats for Banu Saad, but then upon his return to Mecca, 
he tended goats for the Quraysh for a small sum. The choice of occupation was significant. Later, after becoming a prophet, Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, remarked, there has been no prophet who has not tended sheep. Noted for his trustworthiness, honesty and piety, he came to be called Al-Amin, the trustworthy. Journey to Syria on business for Khadija. Muhammad's reputation led Khadija bin Kuwailad to entrust him with her merchandise to sell in Syria. As a wealthy, businesswoman from a noble family of the Quraysh, she would hire men to conduct business on her behalf. And so it happened that the young Muhammad journeyed to Syria with her slave, Maysara. The trip was extremely successful and profitable, and upon his return to Mecca, Muhammad gave Khadija her profit. Marriage to Khadija Khadija was twice widowed, having been married to Atik bin Aid and then to Abu Hala. While married to Abu Hala, she bore a son. Following her second husband's death, she received several proposals from various chiefs of the Quraysh, all of which she refused. Now, however, impressed by Maysara's description of Muhammad's character, she broached the topic of marriage to Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, through her friend, Nafisa. Being open to the idea, he consulted his uncles, who sent his proposal to Amra bin Asad, Khadija's uncle. Amra accepted on his niece's behalf, and Muhammad gave twenty camels as dowry. Some sources mention that he gave her six camels. They were married in the presence of the Banu Hashim and the chiefs of the Quraysh. Praising and glorifying Allah, Abu Talib recited the wedding sermon and formalized the union. Thus within two months and some days within Muhammad's return from Syria, he and Khadija were married. He was 25 years old, while she was either 28 or 40. Khadija was Muhammad's first wife. He married none other during her lifetime. She bore all his children except for Ibrahim, who was born to Maria Kiptia, Mary the Copt. They were named in order of birth Qasim, Zainab, Rikaya, Um Kultum, Fatima, Abdullah, and Ibrahim. Scholars, however, disagree about the exact number and order of births. All the sons passed away during childhood, but all the daughters lived to see their father become a prophet. Each daughter embraced Islam and migrated to Medina, and all but Fatima died during the lifetime of the Prophet. Fatima died six months after her father's death. Dispute over the Black Stone when Muhammad was 35 years old, a devastating flood damaged the Kaaba. The walls of the Kaaba had been weakened by a fire earlier, and the flood caused additional cracks to form. The structure revered by the Quraysh was in danger of collapse. Seeing their house of worship under threat of ruin, the Quraysh decided to rebuild the Kaaba. They resolved not to taint the project with resources gained through usury, prostitution, or larceny. As the walls of the Kaaba had to be torn down before they could be rebuilt, the Quraysh feared Allah would punish anyone who raised his hand against the sacred house. Walid bin Mu'ira was the first to approach the Kaaba, declaring, Allah will not destroy reformers, he began to dismantle the walls of the Kaaba when others saw that he had done so untouched by divine wrath. They joined in the work. They demolished the Kaaba down to the original foundation laid by Ibrahim Abraham. Then the construction started with each tribe being allotted specific duties. The nobles among them carried pieces of stone and piled them up in one place. Muhammad and his uncle Abbas were among those carrying stones. A Roman mason named Barkum reconstructed the walls. However, the tribes were unable to collect enough money to rebuild the Kaaba completely, so a small wall was built showing the boundaries of the original foundation laid by Ibrahim. This small wall enclosed an area of about six cubits on the northern side of the Kaaba and is called Hijar Ismail. When the wall was completed up to the spot where the black stone al Hajar al Aswad was located, a dispute arose. Each chieftain claimed the honor of putting the black stone in place. The crisis continued for four or five days, and bloodshed was imminent. At that time Abu Umayyah the oldest among them, found a solution to the problem. He suggested that the next man who entered the gate of the Kaaba should be given the authority to settle the dispute. Everyone agreed to this suggestion, and it was the will of Allah that the next man to enter the gate was Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. It's Muhammad, they said as soon as they saw him coming. Since he is trustworthy, we all agree to abide by his decision. When Muhammad learned the details of the dispute, he asked them to bring a sheet. He then took the black stone, and placing it on the sheet, 
asked each clan to take hold of an edge of the sheet and lift it in unison. When the black stone was lifted up by the tribal chieftains, Muhammad pushed it into place with his own hands. Everyone was satisfied with Muhammad's decision, and a great conflict was averted. The black stone rests about one and a half meters above the ground, with the Kaaba door about half a meter above the black stone. The Quraysh did not lower the position of the door because they did not want anyone to enter the Kaaba without their permission. They also doubled the height of the walls from 9 to 18 cubits, added a roof 15 cubits in height and six pillars in two rows inside the Kaaba to support it. Muhammad's character before prophethood from childhood, Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him was exceptionally intelligent, and chaste and was highly regarded for his honesty, valor, justice, piety, patience, modesty, loyalty and hospitality. Abu Talib described his beloved nephew in the following words. He is fair and handsome, from his visage, mercy falls like rain. He is a shelter for the orphan and a protector of widows. Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him maintained good relations with his family, bore others' burdens, and guided the destitute towards self-sufficiency. In keeping with his future role as Allah's messenger, one who was to outlaw all aspects of idolatry and polytheism, Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him had an inherent hatred for the prevailing paganism of his time. Thus, although he was an integral part of his society, Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him never attended any of the important local festivals and fairs that revolved around idol worship and drinking. He was also careful not to eat the flesh of any animal slaughtered in the name of someone other than Allah, and avoided touching or even coming close to idols. He especially detested hearing oaths sworn upon the pagans' two most famous idols, that and Utsa. Portents of Prophethood With his aversion to some of the most cohesive social ties in Meccan society, it was inevitable that Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him would grow apart from his fellow Meccans and the depraved way of life that included public drunkenness and female infanticide. He began to long for solitude, and preferred to spend his time alone, away from the noisy festivals and crowded markets. At the same time, he felt the need to save his people from the destruction he felt was imminent. His discontent grew, and he began to seek refuge in the cave of Hera. Here he would spend long periods alone, and it was here that he worshipped not idols or imagined gods, but the one true god Allah. Following the monotheistic practice of his forefather, Ibrahim, every year, for three consecutive years, he spent the month of Ramadan in the cave. He would then return to Mecca, circumambulate the Kaaba, and then go back home. When Muhammad reached forty years of age, he began to experience what could be called portents of prophethood. He would have visions, and whatever appeared to him in these visions and dreams would come true. The first revelation, late one Monday night, just before sunrise on the 21st of Ramadan, August 10, 610 CE, an event transformed the life of the man chosen to deliver Allah's message, just as it would change the lives of countless beings, most of whom were yet to be born. According to the lunar calendar, Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him was 40 years, 6 months and 12 days old, and according to the solar calendar, he was 39 years, 3 months and 22 days old. He was alone in the cave of Hera, engaged in worshipping Allah just like he had done the previous two Ramadans. Ashar, who has narrated so many of the Prophet's words and deeds, relates Muhammad's transition from an ordinary man to someone who would forever be known simply as the Prophet. The Prophet peace and blessings be upon him first began to have revelations in the form of good dreams which came true. Then he began to like solitude. He would go to the cave of Hera and meditate there in solitude for a number of days and nights. He would take provisions with him to stay for an extended period, and when he returned to Khadija, he would stock up again and go back to the cave. This was his practice until truth was revealed to him by an angel while he was in the cave of Hera. The angel said to him, Read. I cannot read, Muhammad replied. The angel then took hold of him and pressed him until he could not endure it any longer. The angel let him go and said once again, Read. I cannot read, Muhammad replied. The angel took hold of him a second time and pressed him until he could not endure it any longer. After letting him go, the angel said, Read. I cannot read, Muhammad repeated. For a third time, the angel took hold of him and pressed him until he could not endure it any longer. The angel released him and said, 
Read in the name of your Lord, the Creator. He who created man from a pot. Read, and your Lord is the most bounteous. The prophet was terrified and his heart was pounding hard. He returned home to Khadija and said, Cover me, cover me. Khadija covered him and helped him calm down. He related what had happened in the cave, and said, I fear that something has happened to me. Never, Khadija replied, I swear by Allah, Allah would never disgrace you. You keep good relations with your family, help the feeble and destitute, serve your guests generously, and assist those who deserve help. Khadija then took the prophet to her cousin, the old and venerable Waraka bin Naufal. He knew Hebrew and was familiar with the Gospels, having left paganism for Christianity. Oh my cousin, Khadija began, listen to your nephew. What have you seen, my nephew, asked the blind old man. The Prophet peace and blessings be upon him told Waraka what had happened in the cave. The angel that was sent to you is the same angel that Allah sent to Musa. I wish I were young and could live to see the day your own people drive you out of this city. Will they drive me out? The Prophet peace and blessings be upon him asked. Yes, replied Naufal. Never has a man brought something such as what you have without meeting hostility. If I live to see the day you are expelled, I will support you with all my might. A few days later, however, Waraka died, and a long time passed before the Prophet peace and blessings be upon him received a second revelation. The Quran tells us that the first revelation descended in Ramadan on the night of power. The month of Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed. 2. 185. We have indeed revealed this message during the night of power. 97. 1.